Okay. All right. So hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Book Cafe podcast. Um, in today's episode, we will be talking about this book right here behind me entitled Solomon and the Ant, the Quran in Conversation with the Bible. And I'm extremely pleased to have the author himself uh, with us for today's episode to talk about the book. But just before that, if you are watching this episode on YouTube, you know, do please take a moment to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon. It really helps us out. And if you are listening to this episode on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or on Spotify, you know, to, do please continue to download and support the show because we're going to have a lot of content, new content added very soon. And in fact, it's fair to say that we have new content coming on all the time. So do please continue to uh, be a patron of the show and to support everything that we're doing here. But as far as this episode goes, you know, let me first do my due diligence and welcome the author himself, Professor Dr. David Penchensky. So hi, Professor. Welcome, uh, first and foremost, to Book Cafe Podcast. Thank you for having me. Okay. So thank you so much for making the time to uh, speak to us, Professor. So you've written a fabulous book, and I'm really, uh, you know, looking forward to deep diving into it with you. But, uh, but, but Professor, uh, just before we get into the book, you know, uh, a lot of our viewers and listeners who may not have read the book yet and who might be discovering you for the very first time, you know, do please take this moment to tell us a little bit more about yourself, you know, your cultural background, your education background, uh, what you do for a living, what you did do for a living, and in fact, anything at all that you'd like to share with us. Sure. I, I was, uh, I grew up in New York City and uh, my family was was not religious at all, but when I got to my Later teenage years, I started uh, exploring religious questions, and and uh, well, I ended up in a, a, a fundamentalist Protestant uh, Christian group, uh, and stayed with them for about sixteen years. Uh, about the time I started my graduate work at university, I, I left that church and and I became a Roman Catholic. I studied Hebrew Bible in Vanderbilt University. Uh, I studied with uh, Professor James Crenshaw for authorities of wisdom literature. And uh, after I got my degree, I worked for a, a little bit of time in uh, an adjunct positions in Kentucky, Bowling Green, Kentucky. And then I, I secured my full-time position at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, my specialty was wisdom literature. I wrote my dissertation on the book of Job. And anyway, I taught at the, uh, in the government of the University of Minnesota, University of St. Thomas, uh, for uh, about uh, 29 years, retired about three years ago. And uh, since that time, I'm teaching intermittently and, and, and writing. Uh, great retirement. I'm having a, a terrific time teaching here and there, uh, doing a course now and then to St. Thomas, uh, teaching in some uh, community places. Let me just talk a little bit about my, my scholarly career. About, about 10 years ago, I, uh, I, I finished a book, uh, uh, kind of a capstone in my career, uh, Introduction to Wisdom Literature. Uh, and uh, when I finished that book, I was looking around for something else to do. Uh, the, 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 you know, it's wide open to me. I could do anything I wanted. And I, I'd finished this thing that I'd been really working on my own. And I decided to, to, to shift my, my focus from the Bible to the Quran, uh, my uh, my wife is, is Muslim and she's a her first language is Arabic and I had been many years in a lot of other venues, and uh, and and we could talk about this a little later about why. But I I started uh, studying the Quran and uh, writing different papers in the Quran and after about ten years, uh, I had accumulated enough work that I put it together and organized it into a book, which is Solomon and the Ant. Okay, all right, fantastic. So, but uh, just for our viewers and listeners who haven't read the book yet, can you just tell us very quickly what the book is actually about? What is it about, really? Sure. Um, is I've assembled nine different Quranic passages, uh, and all of them are narratives of one form or another. I, I really like working with narratives. Mm -hmm. And uh, for each of these nine, I, I, I translated them, I, I memorized them, I, 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 I tried to understand them. I, I read the, the secondary material, the, the ancient commentaries, the modern kind of Quranic scholars, and I tried to come to an understanding of the passage. But because of my background in the Hebrew Bible, uh, as, I, as, I, as I entered into these passages, they kind of life in some ways, 
uh, various biblical passages would suggest themselves. Uh, now, I, I, I need to specify right away, I didn't, I didn't do any Quranic passages that overlap the Bible. That, that, that's done lots of times by many different people. I didn't want to duplicate their work. So I specifically picked passages that didn't overlap the Bible at all. But as I study these passages, uh, uh, different parts suggest themselves to me. And sometimes uh, the, the, the Quranic passage would illuminate the Bible. Uh, sometimes the Quranic passage would illuminate uh, with the Bible passage would illuminate the Quran. Hmm. And uh, I, I put it in dialogue and just, I, I saw what, what came out of it. And uh, when I finished, I had like these nine different uh, chapters, I saw that they fell into like this, this threefold organization rather neatly. So the book is, 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 is really my exploration of the Quran as a biblical scholar. Hmm. And uh, what, what kind of, New insights can I gain by bringing uh, the the methods that I've used career uh, to study and write and teach about the Bible to bring those things over to the Quran and see what I came up with. And I'll say one more thing: uh, what I came up with was, I think, really wonderful. I mean, I, I discovered, I felt I discovered a, a, an inkling of, of the riches that, that 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 one might find in the Quran. It, it's been a very exciting journey for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, uh, I can't wait to deep dive into the book with you, Professor. But just before we do that, you know, um, I have to make mention of the fact that Solomon and the Ant is just one of the nine stories that you touch upon in the book. So can I ask why you picked this uh, to be the eponymous title of the book? So now, why Solomon and the Ant and not something else? Uh, first, I should say that I, yeah. first, I should say that I, I have a lot of trouble with titles. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it was time to title the book i came up with you know maybe a hundred different possibilities are good and so i turned to my friends and and this title actually came from one of my friends and i said i, I can't this can't be the title because it only refers to one chapter mm -hmm. uh and he talked me into it uh in that uh, it doesn't the whole book it just has to kind of a uh, be, be an entrance into the book be a kind of a, a like something that would attract people to the book and he gave me examples of others but as I thought about it, uh, in, in many ways, uh, the chapter on the uh, Surah the, Anamal, the, the Solomon and the Ant, uh, is kind of the centerpiece of the book. Uh, it's a centerpiece, first of all, because uh, I think it, it, it showcases my method, the way I approach the Quran, uh, probably clearer than anything else. Uh, it, it deals with one of the central issues that I've been concerned about in my career, which is the Odyssey. Uh, it's, it's, it's a story. Uh, it, it has uh, like these dramatic scenes. So it, it, it's really, I thought it was appropriate to lead with that particular story, with that particular chapter. So that's why okay. I'm, I'm happy with the title. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, so as long as you're happy with the title, Professor, then we, the readers, are also happy. And yeah, it's, it's a really an interesting title. Right. And of right. course, we, uh, we all know that Solomon himself is, of course, a master of demons. <laughs> but we'll we'll definitely get to that later on. But uh, just before we start, um, Professor, um, how uh, just out of curiosity, how long did it take for you to, uh, you know, to get the entire project together from manuscript to publication? Just how how long did it take for you to publish this book? From from manuscript, not not from when I started writing it, but from manuscript. When I when I finished the manuscript, I I, I of course I I look. I looked for a publisher, and I, I ended up an editor that I'd worked with on my previous book, and uh, he kind of ushered it through. So I'd say from manuscript to publication, uh, maybe three years. Three years. It was uh, Whip and Stock, uh, who, my publisher. Uh, when, when it went through the editing process, I got back from them uh, like uh, 10 pages, single-spaced of things that I had to review and look over, and it was probably the hardest part of the writing boy uh, they, they put me through it and i'm really glad because yeah they, they were committed to it being the best book that it possibly could be about three years i'd say okay about three years and and let me just uh, correct myself so if i were to say um how long did it take you from the the first instance that you started writing to the first manuscript draft uh, how long would that be well i'm i'm saying roughly 10 years uh okay. but i have to say that in the middle i had to take three years out because right. I was commissioned to write the uh, chapter in the book of Hosea mm -hmm. for uh, the Jerome biblical commentary of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And I'd never done anything on the book of Hosea before. So it took me to write that. So I had to put this project down and then pick it up again. 
uh, but so so ten year, about ten or eleven years total, from beginning to end. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah, it's hard to believe I've been working on it for that long, but yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that, that's amazing. Well, I, I'm sure that the final product, you know, I've loved reading it and, and I really hope that anybody who's watching or listening to this podcast, you know, does uh, also pick up the book and enjoy it as well. Okay, so Professor, let me just uh, backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit about the three main themes in the book. And you've already alluded to one of them, which is the problem of the Odyssey. And uh, the other two, are, uh, are the problem of polytheism, and the third one is the problem of revelation. So rather than being presumptuous about what exactly polytheism, theodicy, and revelation are supposed to signify, uh, would you mind just taking this opportunity to help define the three terms for those of our viewers sure, sure. who may not be as familiar with these three particular terms? Yeah. Well, uh, obviously, uh, the, the definition of polytheism is many gods. So it's the belief in many gods. And uh, the reason this is important for the Quran is because the Quran it frames itself as a movement that is in confrontation with people who believe in many gods. So that, that's primary issues that Islam faces at its birth. And really, it's one of the primary ways that Islam defines itself is as, as, a, as, as a religion of one a belief in one god. So uh, that, that was the, my first interest. And I was, uh, uh, we will talk about content later, uh, but right now we're just defining. Uh, theodicy, which again has been a, a major concern uh, for me most of my career. Uh, literally the word means uh, the justification of God, but a better way to explain it is uh, uh, if we have a good God, why do bad things happen? Why? Uh, why uh, suffer? Why doesn't God intervene? If God is good and if God is all-powerful, then why has not God alleviated uh, the terrible, terrible and unjust suffering uh, that we see all the time in the world? And this is a, this is a central problem uh, for all of the monotheistic religions. You see, if you believe in a lot of gods, then you could blame the bad gods for all the bad things that happen. But if you have a unitary God, a, a monotheistic faith, uh, well, then who do you blame for the bad things that happen? And and monotheism has always struggled uh, to come up with adequate answers for that. And I'm not even sure we've ever come up with fully adequate answers. But I was very interested in exploring how uh, the Quran addressed those issues, which every, every monotheistic religion faces. And I found that the Quran faces them in a, in, in a very creative way. Uh, and, and again, we can talk about that more later. And then the final one, Revelation, um, right. it raises a, a number of questions. First of all, yeah. uh, what is the process uh, a, a, a divine message is communicated to the human realm? How, how does that happen? How does that take place? There's some really interesting uh, Quranic passages that actually uh, describe the mechanism of this. Uh, but then uh, the, the other question that it's raised is, is, is prophetic authority. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody, somebody comes along and says uh, that I have a message that I received from God. Uh, right. Why should why should you believe them? Why should you over that one? So there's the there's the problem of verification, and, and then the final problem is is the problem of uh, of the uh, the prophet uh, themselves. Uh, the, 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 a human being is a finite vessel. How, how does a finite and uh, may I say flawed human being? Uh, uh, bear a divine message. How, how, do, how, do, how, do, how does the interaction between uh, the fallibility of the prophet relating to the infinity uh, of the divine message? So that those are the three things I encounter in the last section of the on Revelation. So Absolutely. those are my definitions. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, cool. And uh, yeah, I think the the problem of theodicy, if I'm just allowed to digress a bit, is really it really is very problematic for monotheistic religions, like you said, because you have only one supreme deity, so who do you blame for all the ills that are going on in the world? And uh, I think that if memory serves me right, uh, you know, Dr. Bart Ehrman actually wrote a book called God's Problem, where he tries to attempt to answer the, the problem of theodicy. And uh, I actually just have it written down here, you know, I think he mentioned five things. We'll not dwell too much on it, but just for to, to give our viewers and listeners a holistic picture. You know, I think he said that you know suffering is a punishment from God for sinning, or it could be because suffering happens because human beings abuse and oppress others, 
uh, because God uses suffering for redemptive purposes or as a test of faith, or we simply don't know why, you know, God would choose to make people suffer. So that that's something that I really want to get into, uh, and I, I hope that we get a chance to talk at length about that. But would you agree with uh, the, these at least these five, uh, you know, points that Ehrman has mentioned in his book that, yes, maybe one of these could help to, uh, you know, resolve the problem of the Odyssey or God's problem? You know, as he puts it. I, well, I, I have not read the book, but it's a, it's a good list. Yeah. As long as we understand that that the list is a list of of five possible scenarios, uh, and it, it, and it's not like they're all true or that they yeah. all work in every situation. And the his last uh, uh, scenario, uh, which is that we 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 don't actually understand and we can't cannot know. I, I that that's that's really where I end up. Right. But I, I, I go a little bit further than that and say uh, uh, that uh, there are there are situations uh, that are framed by, and this is what really surprised me, is that it, I found it in the Quran as well as in the Bible, where it becomes the most appropriate thing to do uh, to protest against the injustice of, 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 of innocent suffering, let's say, to protest with God against innocent, just, innocent suffering. And uh, pious people tend to be very skittish about, uh, you know, railing at others, shouting to the heavens. But, uh, but I find both the Bible and the Quran make room for that. In fact, I, I think even encourage it. So that, that I would go that one step further. That, that, that's what makes it meaningful for me. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if I'm allowed to digress just a little bit more, Professor, if... You know, and we will talk about sure. Zoroastrianism at one at some point as well. But uh, you know, as, as and from my limited knowledge of Zoroastrianism, you know, I believe that Ahura Mazda uh, is the supreme deity, and he also has a counterpart, and so that yin and yang, uh, which goes with uh, you know, maybe this is just a paradigm that the Zoroastrians have figured out to try and explain uh, the problem of theodicy. So, do you feel that maybe this would this duality that Zoroastrianism seems to subscribe to? would be one possible answer to the problem of theodicy? It's, it, it definitely is an answer, but it is not a monotheistic answer. I said that right. theodicy is a problem for monotheists. If you're not a monotheist, and yeah. that's that's a kind of bi-theism. I don't, I'm not an expert on Zoroastrianism, but there's even a certain expressions of Christianity that frame God and, the, and, and Satan as, as, as relatively equal combatants, and that becomes a kind of duality. So right. yeah, a way to get out from under the problem of theodicy is to stop being a monotheist. That's it. that's a mm -hmm. I I I'm I'm not comfortable with that solution as a as a Christian. Okay, okay, all right, no worries. So uh, so we'll keep that in mind, and uh, you know, this is just a, a a small trailer for the rest of the episode because we will come back to Zoroastrianism at some point during the episode. But for, for sure, now, sure. Uh, Professor, let's deep dive into some of the nine uh, stories that you alluded to in the book. And uh, we'll, yeah. we'll try and do our due diligence and maybe try and cover as much as possible. But we also don't want to cover everything. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be able to motivate anybody to go and get the book. So we'll, we'll just restrict ourselves to a couple of the stories. And, and so the, the, the first two um, you know, stories that I really like to touch upon, Professor, is uh, Surat al-Falak and Surat al-Nas, uh, you know, the daybreak and uh, mankind or hum humankind, you know, however we want to translate it. Um, you mentioned in the book that these two uh, surahs uh, do not challenge Tawheed, the doctrine of oneness, but they actually problematize it. So can you help us understand why these two surahs are uh, problematize the doctrine of oneness, you know, the, the concept of Tawheed? Do please walk us through that. Um, first of all, I should say that this, not only the first chapter in the book, but it's the first chapter I actually wrote. So it's the first thing I ever wrote about the, about the Quran. So it was, a, and, and the reason I picked it was because of, uh, the, the strangeness of them, of the, this, this, this world that was, that was uh, depicted in these two surahs uh, of, uh, of of human beings just surrounded by all of these malevolent forces that are that are threatening to break in and 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 and, and uh, you know pleading with God to protect them from these things. Uh, so why do I say that it's problematizing uh, uh, monotheism? Well, uh, what happened to all of the gods 
that the, that the people in Arabia worshipped? Well, uh, the most obvious monotheistic answer to that is they do not exist and they never existed. That yeah. would be the, the orthodox, pious, monotheistic answer. And you get a similar answer from, from Jews and Christians as you would from Muslims. Uh, however, that's not the only answer that the Quran gives, because in a lot of cases, the, these figures that had been gods as in ancient Arabian practice, um, these figures that had been, uh, people had worshipped them, people had brought petitions to them, they prayed to them. Well, the Quran don't exist. The Quran demotes them, makes them powerless, makes them subservient to the one God. So that's what I mean by problematizing, that the figures still exist first as pictured by the, uh, the the Quran, is filled with these invisible spiritual uh, creatures, uh, uh, and, and and orthodoxy says that the, you know they were made by God, so they had to be. Uh, but but they're, they're still around, and mm. that's what I mean by problematizing. These guys are still around, and and the, the Quran has to deal with that. And they don't only deal with it by saying they don't exist. They also deal with it by uh, they're not. They're not so powerful. Mm. That's a, that, that would be my, you know, the, the the Jin chapter particularly goes into that war in heaven. So anyway, that's how that's what I mean by problematizing. Great, great. And those are the I mean, the last the last two surahs in the Quran are a really good example of that because mm. the it, it's it's a universe it's a frightening universe. It's people with all of these malevolent beings that are trying to get them, uh, and, and it it, uh, it even uh, seems to uh, implicate God mm. in, in, in some of these terrifying things that are happening. So it's it's monotheistic, but it's a it's a it's a it's a complex monotheism. It's not right. it's not a pure monotheism where the yeah. the only supernatural creature of any against of any account is 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 the one God. It, mm. It's more it's more complex than that. For sure, for sure, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think that's really well said, Professor. And uh, you know, once again, from my limited knowledge of the Hebrew Bible and uh, Judeo-Christian history, you know, there, there's something else that I wanted to ask, Professor. I mean, uh, would you say that the Judaism is more henotheistic than monotheistic? Or, uh, and uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we do have the Hebrew Bible saying, you know, uh, one of the Ten Commandments being that thou shall not have any other gods besides um, Yahweh. And so that sort of presupposes that these other gods do exist. And so you go from polytheist, from a polytheistic worldview to a henotheistic worldview, which is the worship of a primary god. And then perhaps the next step on the evolutionary ladder is pure monotheism, which Islam brings. So with that in context, I mean, would you say that the these early Meccan surahs, you know, Daybreak and Nas, uh, you know, man, humanity, is probably trying to sift through that uh, primordial henotheism to true monotheism, uh, how would you look at it in that context? Well, the last thing you said is very interesting, but I want to I want to get to the earlier things you said first. Um, uh, I your definition of henotheism is 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 fine. I, I would maybe add it's the existence of many gods, the worship of only one. Mm -hmm. And I would say uh, you're you're completely accurate that the Hebrew Bible uh, tends towards a henotheistic view of the world. Uh, a, a book I wrote was uh, called Twilight of the Gods. It's just on, on that very topic. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that Judaism is henotheistic because Judaism develops out of the Hebrew Bible, but but moves further in the direction of absolute monotheism. So Judaism, I wouldn't call henotheistic. Mm -hmm. uh, but the last thing you said uh, is, is is really interesting is to is to tie in uh, those. Uh, with a, a a struggle with henotheism, and and uh, you, you're taking what I said, and you're taking it a little bit further, and and I want to think about that, but that's that's a really interesting idea. I'm taking it in that direction, but I think it that's worth that's worth considering. Yeah, for sure, for sure, and and um, yeah, if uh, if you're if there is something that I've been able to help you, you know, think further about, Professor, you know. And I'm yeah. probably doing my job as a host, but but you're too kind. Thank you so much uh, for that, Professor. But um, so, Professor, having said all that, um, you know, uh, there's something else that uh, I wanted to just uh, ask you, you know, for the benefit of our viewers and listeners. 
these last two surahs or chapters, and uh, again, a lot of people believe that they're very early Meccan, but was there ever any kind of sort of controversy as to whether they ought to be included in the final canon of the Quran? I think you mentioned something like that in the book, correct? Yeah, you're reminding me of that. I've forgotten. But yes, there, there, there was a controversy about those two because they, uh, they, I, I, I mean, the, the, I'm not going to get into the whole chronology chronology stuff. You know what's early, what's late, but right. they do represent a, a certain approach to religion, which uh, which we would we would identify more as as folk religion mm -hmm. uh, than than the the, the more elevated uh, philosophical theology that we might see right. in some other parts of the Bible, and it, you see that all over the Bible as well. Mm -hmm. Things that. Uh, uh, you know, later, later uh, biblical writers would be horrified by, and they have to explain it away. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So, so uh, moving on from these two surahs, uh, Professor, you know, let's touch upon another uh, chapter or surah in the Quran, uh, which will be very familiar to you know every single Muslim in, in the world probably because it is wh what's required. You know, it's it's a very staple surah to have memorized. Uh, to to go through the liturgical prayers, the ritual prayers, and that is of course Surah Al Masad, also sure. known as right the Abu Lahab Surah. So um, I, I must confess that uh, I I think that the the you know there was one particular hadith where the Prophet is reported to have said that this was one of those chapters or surahs that really made him feel very uncomfortable because it was so full of fire and brimstone. But uh, if I were to get your opinion on this, Professor, uh, can you help shed some light on who exactly is the person of Abu Lahab that is being re referenced in this surah? You know, please walk us through that. Well, we, we have three different uh, lines of narrative that combine. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is the narrative that we would actually see in the Quran itself. It's just uh, an, an anonymous figure. His, his named Abu Lahab, which means you know uh, father of flames, and his wife, and this these things happen to him, but there's no further identification. But as I have found with many of the surahs, uh, there, there's a very rich tradition uh, of of later interpretation that 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 fills in the gaps and uh, makes clear things that are and connects the story with actual events in the early history of the Islamic community. And that's the case of this one. And so in the, the fairly early uh, uh, post documents, uh, like maybe 100 years after the death of the prophet, uh, we, we get two different identifications of Abu Lahab. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, relates him to uh, one of uh, uh, who uh, the story goes that uh, he and his wife uh, did everything they could uh, to to hinder the prophet in in his message and, and and to just cause all kinds of difficulties to him, and that of course would explain uh, the dire punishments that are given to both of them. Uh, the other uh, the other very early uh, reconstruction of, of of the details of the story uh, identify Abu Lahab and Abdul Uzza, uh, who was understood as to be the one who uh, who guarded the image of the god Uzza and kept the flame. Before the god was uh, in in the the Kaaba before uh, before uh, Muhammad uh, took uh, Mecca, so uh, we have three different figures. We have Abu Lahab Ran, we have uh, uh, this uncle of uh, of Muhammad, and we have uh, Abdul Uzza, and, and and the tradition kind of combines all three of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say anything historical veracity of that. I have no way of, no way of knowing right. uh, it. it when I when I when I read the surah, it really sounds like it's referring to some locally known person, and that's about as far as I would go with any certainty. But the the traditions that follow from uh, the, the surah are very, and I couldn't I couldn't address the surah without also addressing uh, those other stories. So that it, it really made for a, an interesting mix, mm -hmm. which always seems to happen. I'm I'm finding. Uh, you know, I, I examine the surah, I start looking at the traditions, and the traditions uh, add a lot, mm -hmm. and 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 they're they're meant to uh, to control the interpretation in, in a certain direction. I, I I would sometimes I want to resist that direction because if you read if you read 
a sort of a, a, by itself, it, it's it, it sounds like it's um kind of an attack against riches, <laughs> the danger of riches, uh, without any of this other political overlay. But the political overlay is really interesting. I tried to cover all of it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So that's sure. about as far as I go. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. And thank you so much for that, Professor. Um, so you're definitely non-committal on which, uh, you know, interpretation would best fit it. But if I may also be very bold, uh, Professor, as to suggest an alternative view to what you've already stated. Uh, and this just comes from, you know, my habit of reading, you know, books. And so I, I just happened to read a book called The War of the Three Gods, uh, Romans, Persians, and the Rise of Islam by uh, Peter Crawford, uh, a renowned historian. And um, and so uh, if I if I could just digress once again and kind of try and see if this makes better sense uh, with regards to the person of Abu Lahab, um, as you know that uh, during the time that the Quran made its appearance and the Prophet had, uh, you know jumped onto the pages of history, the the two superpowers of the day were the Byzantine Romans and the Sassanid Persians, and so uh, the Sassanid Persians had actually stolen the true cross from Jerusalem and they took it back with them uh, to Persia. And the, and the Persian king at the time, Khusro II, had actually presented the true cross to his wife, uh, Shirin, who happened to be a Christian. And then a couple of years later, you know, the, the emperor Heraclius actually brought the true cross back to Jerusalem. But long story short, I, I believe that uh, uh, in the year 615 CE, uh, sorry, I think it was six, yeah, 615, um, there was actually a, a surah that came down to the prophet uh, called Surah Rum, where, uh, which essentially means Rome or Roman, where the, 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 the Arabs, uh, at least on a nominal uh, level, seems to be at least spiritually aligned with the Byzantine oh. Romans. And so uh, they, they sort of, th- that surah made a prediction that, yes, the Romans lost a battle in a land nearby, but within a few short years, uh, you know, anywhere between three to nine years, they're going to be victorious again. So would you feel, do you feel that uh, maybe this Surah Lahab could actually be some kind of anti-Persian or anti-Sassanid uh, propaganda because of the fact that they were Zoroastrians and the fact that Abu Lahab's wife himself, uh, herself also makes an appearance in the Surah. And so, you know, all these coincidences together. So what, what would you make of all this, Professor? Does this make better sense? in addition to the the three theories that you've already I certainly would have to take a look at that book uh, I would certainly have to take a look at that book which is which seems very interesting I I, I do not feel qualified to uh, uh, evaluate that without having read the book uh, my only question would be uh, it, it, it is is does the Quran uh, the, and, and this is a genuine question I'm not making a statement here does the Quran uh, engage in this kind of symbolic language uh such as you're suggesting um uh to to, to refer to uh you know these these larger political you know issues and and my 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 initial sense is no but i don't know enough to to, to say yeah. that in yeah. way of confidence but Absolutely. i would definitely i'm interested in that book yeah, for sure, for sure. And if I may just add, uh, Professor, one last thing, like with regards to Surat Ar-Rum, as in the Roman Surah, um, the, that definitely is a, uh, you know, bona fide geopolitical statement because the, the Surah is aligning with the Byzantine Romans by saying that the Persians will be overthrown after uh, another couple of years. And so uh, I think the, exe- the exegesis with regards to this particular Surah is that when it says that you know they'll be victorious in a few short years, um, a lot of interpreters seem to think that that's somewhere between three to nine years. And so, lo and behold, after 615 CE, uh, the first time that the that Heraclius actually won a battle against the Persians and you know kind of brought it back to parity was in the year 624 CE. But at the end of the day, you know who knows? Um, you know, I'm just uh, t- speaking as a lay historian. I, I believe that if you do get a chance to read the book. You know, I'd be really, you know, uh, curious to know the conclusion that you've come to. And yes, I, I do highly recommend and, and the, the book as the well. Sir, the sir that you mentioned seems much more closely tied with those historical events than uh, Surat al-Masad. But uh, yeah. I'm, I'm open. I'm open. What can I yeah. say? Okay. All right. Okay, then. All right. So, Professor, um, so what we'll do now is uh, let's jump ahead to another surah, which I'm really excited to talk about. 
Uh, and that is uh, sur uh, chapter 80, Surah Abasa. Otherwise, in English, it's called He Frowned, right? And so uh, my question to you, first and foremost, Professor, is that, uh, that th this particular surah is one of the very few surahs that, put, that gives a negative portrayal of the Prophet Muhammad. And we are making the assumption that maybe he is the subject or the person who actually frowned. Because as, as far as my knowledge goes, that in the Shia tradition, for example, uh, they seem to deny that, no, this isn't the prophet, you know, th this is actually an unnamed companion of the prophet who actually did this. And so in order to, you know, save him his blushes, he's going to stay unnamed. But, you know, that could also be a, a hagiographical interpretation, for example. So would you mind telling us a little bit about this particular surah, you know, he frowned, and what, what are the implications and ramifications with regards to how you interpret the, 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 yeah. the, the Shia interpretation? really seems like spin control right uh, they're, they're they're starting from a certain assumption the prophet cannot do something like this and then how can we read it so that it doesn't seem like the prophet is the one who's doing it and uh, i i i don't i i, I see that as really a speech this reason uh, i don't think there, there's any question that the uh the the, the, the surah the language of the surah itself mm -hmm. is critical of the behavior of the prophet in this case and again that interesting thing to have in, in the quran uh it's it's not the only place in the quran where the uh where where the prophet is criticized mm -hmm. uh so uh, uh i think i think those are important uh, important places to examine when we when we think of the nature what is the nature of prophecy now the, the thing is the uh the bible any kind of an idea that prophets have to be sinless that, that just that's that's the furthest thing from 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 the way they describe uh, their key religious figure. Uh, so this uh, th this is this is something that's definitely not in the Bible, and I'm finding it's not in the Quran as well, but it is in Islamic tradition, both uh, Sunni and Shia, where, where I find people are very uncomfortable uh, with with any any disparagement of of, of, of somebody recognized as a prophet. And, and this comes out in this story. Uh, this also comes out when when Moses murders the Egyptian. And, and I, I find that the, the arguments that people make to defend uh, what 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 just seems to be um, uh, un, unacceptable behavior, we'll say, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the 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 contort go through to make it not say what it actually says uh, to me is ludicrous. Uh, let's just look at the text and, and, and see what it, and say what it says. It, and it, it says that you know, for instance, he turned aside from a marginalized, weak figure uh, towards somebody that he thought would be more advantageous uh, for him politically in his in his, in his situation. There, there, there is a fact that, and and I have I, I have a feeling. I mean, from from what little I know about the character of the prophet as he's depicted in the Quran and the traditions. Uh, he he would accept the correction. Hmm. He was he was he, he was very humble. Uh, I mean, uh, Muslims are always saying that you know, or, or let's just say, Muhammad is always saying that he's just a human being. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, people people want to want to make him more than that. Uh, and that, that's and that's to me that's unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and I and I think that uh, that also raises an interesting question about the infallibility of the prophets. And of course, as you alluded to. You know, and I do agree with what you said in a lot of your prior interviews that the the biblical prophets or the biblical characters are much more interesting in the sense that they they do come across as very three dimensional. And when I read the you know the same characters being portrayed in the Quran, uh, they do come across as very bland and boring and very you know cookie cutter two dimensional you know uh, characters. And I maybe. Uh, 20 years back when my knowledge was a lot less and a zeal was a lot more, I might have, you know, enjoyed the Quranic characters more. But the older I get, the more I actually enjoy reading about the biblical characters, you know, their human frailties and their flaws and everything that they bring to the table. And so how did you experience that, Professor, when you went from biblical studies to Quranic studies and you saw the contrast between the way the characters are portrayed in these two traditions? Uh, did did that? Did you find that you know a little off-putting or boring? Uh, how did you uh, respond to that when you first came across it? In some cases, I did. 
But what surprised me was the cases where I didn't find that. Mm -hmm. and we, we might get into talking about Solomon later. That would be an example. Right. Um, but uh, and then, but, uh, well, an example of where it was, I did find it off-putting is, uh, is, is the, uh, uh, when Abraham is offering his son uh, on the altar. And, and, and the, 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 the biblical uh, figure uh, is, is, is clearly very disturbed by, by what's taking place. And, uh, and and Abraham has to tie him up to keep him from running away. Uh, the, uh, the the figure the figure in is is not not as believable because he just well you know well father whatever God tells you to do you know just go ahead and do it. Uh, but so so th those things are there. But then then we get other situations where where it, it opens up just a little bit like like when when Noah is about the death of his son. And, and 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 God rebukes him, mm -hmm. but but I, I see the same kind of uh, humanity in, in in that in that little that little hesitant uh, that I that I see in the Bible, and and, and the, the more the more I'm looking at some of these passages, and admittedly I I'm looking at I'm looking for edgy passages. I tend to things, uh, but I, I'm seeing more of that than really expected to. Uh, mm -hmm. The Quran tends to be uh, you know much much more nervous about doing that but they that they 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 end up doing it in in more places than i would have expected sure. the first the first quranic passage that ever uh, attracted me uh my my, my wife was, was is an artist and she was using it in, in an art piece uh and it was about joseph mm -hmm. and uh when i read about uh, the, uh, the, the, the wife of his master and and she prays joseph in front of all these women and they cut their hands and i thought this is hilarious, and it's not in the Bible, but this is a, this is a horrific story. So, yes, I agree with you, but it's 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 not it's 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 it, it's here and there. But but there's some really rich characterizations that one sees in the Quran. Mary uh, would be another example. Mm -hmm. uh, really rich, rich characterization of, Quran, of Mary in the Quran, in in many ways more than what one sees in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's it's a trade off. Okay, for sure, for sure. You know, and uh, and speaking of Mary, Professor, you know, I, I just wanted to digress a little bit more and ask, um, uh, given your ca background as a Roman Catholic, you know, I was, uh, I assume that maybe you might have, and, and of course you did mention that you're, you uh, specialized in the Hebrew Bible and not the New Testament, but did, were you at any point, you know, tempted to include at least one story about Jesus and Mary uh, in this book, uh, you know, so, because of how how he's held in such high esteem by almost three billion people, so do you feel that it might have was it was it ever something in contention well, I, to make it to the final draft of the book? Um, no, and the reason is because I I was not going to use any passages that overlap the Bible. My I'm I'm running out of narratives that are really juicy to write about the left of the Bible, and my wife is trying to convince me to to. Uh, uh, suspend that rule and I'm, I, I might do that so in the future maybe yes but it didn't really I wasn't going to do anything like that for this particular project mm -hmm. okay all right fair enough fair enough okay so so coming to uh but I have uh, I've done some stuff on Mary okay 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 awesome so uh, and we'll, we'll definitely look to uh you know look forward to your future writing projects which talk more about yes. Mary and hopefully Jesus as well okay so professor we definitely cannot uh you know not talk about the eponymous, uh, you know, Solomon and the ant. It's in the title of the book, so we definitely have to touch upon both Solomon and the ant. And uh, I must confess that uh, when you spoke about Solomon in the book and the way that he was, you know, as you said in a previous episode, he made a complete. He was being a complete uh, ass, and he was being. Uh, he was so full of hubris and arrogance and etc. And and that wasn't something that I kind of uh, associated with my reading of the of those particular passages. So if I were to kind of, you know, push back here a little bit, Professor, and say that, you know, there are people who will say that, no, wait, Solomon isn't really being such a, such a hard person, you know, in every single uh, passage, even if he does come across as arrogant, he, it's also juxtaposed with the fact that he's constantly asking God for forgiveness. And so how would you respond to those critics who say that, you know, uh, we're, we're we're, the, the portrayal is being a bit too skewed towards the negative. 
uh, in the book. So how would you respond to that? Well, I have been accused of that before. Um, you have to look for what Solomon does, and secondly, what Solomon says. What he does in every one of his interactions in this section of uh, the Ansura, uh, he's always bullying and domineering. Mm -hmm. That's what he does. He he he, he bullies and domineers uh, the uh, hood hood the bird, and then finally the queen of Sheba. Uh, what he says. He, he makes some very pious statements, uh, but if you, if, you, if you unpack the statements, what he's thanking God for is that he's better than anybody else. Mm, and right. th that's a kind of piety that I think is, is a false piety. It, it, re it reminded me of a, a parable that Jesus tells about two people going to the temple to pray. And one says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the other says, I thank God that I'm not a sinner like this miserable person next to me. And, and, and Jesus said, I think, left, left the temple justified. Well, I see Solomon's prayers as, as like that. Uh, if I, a third point uh, is, is the contrast with the Queen of Sheba. Hmm. Uh, every single thing that she does is gracious and, and, and seeking for peace. Every single thing that Solomon does is aggressive and... Uh, uh, violent and threatening, and I, 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 I cannot, I cannot see that that it was that everything was described this way that it wouldn't have been intentional. That 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 the the, 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 the writer really wanted the reader to 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 to, to react negatively to Solomon mm -hmm. uh, and 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 to see his his actions as bullying. And, and, uh, and this is so anyway, that, that's what I would argue. Now, the people who are arguing differently, it seems to me, are not arguing from this Solomon, but rather other depictions of Solomon elsewhere in the Quran and in the tradition and in the Bible. And uh, Solomon doesn't come off great in the Bible either, actually. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. All right. Fair enough, Professor. So I, I think that's a really interesting uh, you know, feedback to, to those uh, critics who might mm -hmm. say that you know, it's being too skewed towards the negative side. And of course, uh, you know, you alluded to the Queen of Sh uh, Sheba, uh, Professor, so we really have to talk about her as well, because she's uh, she's the third person in the story, along with the ant and the hudhud. Uh, and so the Queen of Sheba and the way that Solomon interacts with her professor. You know, I, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, as somebody, you know, we're both living in the 21st century. And of course, uh, hist historically, human humanity has always been very skewed towards a patriarchal society. Uh, but how are we to look at this tension between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba? And is this really just a story that's trying to tell us that, you know, the patriarchy is going to triumph no matter what? Or is there an alternative explanation that we as readers haven't figured out yet uh, in, in the interaction between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba? You know, what, what would be your thoughts on that? Well, I uh, really could read the story on two different levels. On, on one level, it's a story of uh, the, the great prophet Solomon uh, wins over this pagan monarch to monotheism, and hooray for that. Uh, right. But I think there's something else going on another level. It, all we have to do is, is read it from the perspective of the woman. Mm -hmm. and, and then we see two entirely different uh, uh, ways of conducting one's relationship. And uh, and then you know, re re well, it actually it, it results in in her submitting to him. But do we see that as like a like a great victory, or do we see it as a tragedy? If we read it from the perspective of the woman, it's a tragedy. The the, the thing that first attracted Solomon's attention to her is that this is this is a woman who's running this country, mm. and this is the woman who I'm the only one should have a great throne. So the the. The, the, the very uh, occasion for the conflict was, in fact, um, a challenge to the patriarchal authority of Solomon. And I think I think that those are very, very, very much in the, in the front of the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I see I, Queen of Sheba, just to summarize, I see the Queen of Sheba as a, as, as a very sympathetic figure. And I, I see her submission at the is uh, she, 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 she submitted to what was more powerful to her. I, I would compare that to the ending of the book of Job, because Job, too, submits to the superior power of Yahweh. But I would argue uh, 
loses his dignity in in the process and never quite recovers from that. That, that that's that, that's what it, I wrote my dissertation on that. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Fair enough. So, right. So, okay. So, so we leave the Solomon story and the Queen of Sheba, and sure, sure. you know, maybe, uh, ho hopefully, uh, you know, I'll, I'll digress just a little bit more, Professor. Um, in the sense that, you know, I live in a country, you know, Bangladesh, where we've had two women prime ministers, and we're extremely proud of that. And I can't tell you uh, how many times I've heard growing up that, uh, you know, the some, you know religious minded people would always quote these hadith that said that a country ruled by a woman will never prosper. And so uh, obviously, you know, th those were, those definitely couldn't have been authentic hadiths, you know, and this is, and I do not believe that, you know, Islam subscribes to a patriarchal worldview. And so definitely, you know, it's really uh, wonderful that, you know, these conversations are happening where we're challenging the patriarchy and challenging old assertions and the fact that, you know, we're able to, uh, you know, help uh, women, you know, uplift themselves. And and my wife's a feminist and she always tells me that, Omar, always keep one thing in mind that whenever, uh, you know, the only way women can succeed is if the men are there to help support them, right? And so I, I'm sure that you probably subscribe to the same worldview as I do. And so uh, we, we do hope that, you know, we'll be able to find very much so, very much so absolutely. All right. So, uh, Professor, on that note, I have to say that I've uh, pretty much exhausted all of my questions for this show, but I do have uh, some surprise, a surprise guest question for you. And in fact, I have two of them. And the first surprise guest question, which I have, is from somebody that you know very well. And his name is Professor Dr. Emran El Badawi uh, from the University of Houston. And he was oh. also, yes, he also, um, uh, uh, you know, wrote. A recommendation of, uh, on the book, and so uh, Emran is also a friend of the show. He did an episode with us, as you well know, and and so the question that he sent us, and and I should also mention that he's the author of several books, including the Quran and the Aramaic Gospel Traditions, which we had featured on the show, and he's also written two more books, including uh, Communities of the Quran and uh, Queens and Prophets. And so the question that Emran has for you, uh, which I'm just going to read out, is. Uh, dear Professor, it is commonly accepted that modern Quran studies borrow tools and methods from modern biblical studies because the latter has been around longer in the Western academy at least. Uh, in your research or experience, is the opposite true as well? In other words, are there any tools in biblical studies that can, that, that can or should be borrowed from uh, Quranic studies? So yeah, the question from Imran al -Badawi. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, boy, um, it's a hard question. I and I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. Uh, what I, the first thing I, mean, I first thing I thought of was uh, the uh, um, the relationship of the 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 the, uh, the text of the Quran uh, to the uh, traditions that come out of the Quran. I think there's a much richer uh, uh, conversation going on about that in Quranic studies than there would be uh, in, in, in a bit, or at least it's it's different in a way that I think would be very helpful. Um, I'm j still just learning about uh, about scholarly uh, methodologies with the Quran. I, I have the privilege of uh, being in at the very beginning of the International Quran of the Quranic Studies Association. Uh, and I've been going to all the, their meetings, and I go there to learn because I, I'm just learning what the methodologies are. And, and the, the thing that, that stands out to me is they're really different, and it's a different language. It's like going, and I'm, I, I have a lot of gaps, so uh, I, 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 I want to struggle with that question a lot more, than, uh, but I need to learn a lot more about, and I need to read a lot more of the books of my, of my, uh, my Quranic scholarship. I have a lot more to learn. So that that question just exposes the, the areas in me that I, I I need more to learn. So thank you very much for that question, uh, even though I don't have a good answer. <laughs> no, no, not a problem, Professor. We'll take your answer as it is. And, and and as I like to tell my you know my friends and family members that you know education is finite, and you know it stops at with your graduate studies, postgraduate, you know, or your PhD. But learning is a lifelong commitment, right? So we never, ever stop learning. 
and it's really wonderful to see that you know even after retirement you know you, you always have this thirst for knowledge and to learn new things and, I, and it's really an ab admirable trait that I, I i hope that anybody who's watching or listening to this podcast will also pick up on okay so professor uh, that was the first of our surprise guest questions i do have actually uh, i do actually have another one for you and this question also comes from somebody who is a friend of the show and his name is Professor Dr. Gabriel Said Reynolds from the University of Notre Dame. And he, exactly. And he's the author of the book, Allah Got in the Quran. He also has a couple of new books out. And uh, obviously, you were also on his show uh, we, entitled Exploring the Quran and the Bible. And, uh, and for our viewers and listeners who haven't seen that episode, you know, do please uh, check out Professor Dr. Gabriel Said Reynolds' uh, channel on YouTube called Exploring the Quran and the Bible. And so the, the question that Gabriel has for you, Professor, is, um, dear Professor, why does the Quran, relative to the Bible, uh, seem particularly interested in angels, demons, and the jinn? Right, there you go. Um, I feel like I'm back in graduate school with these tough questions. Um, I think uh, there, there, there would be two reasons. Uh, one, of, of course, is, is the... Uh, uh, the, the very, very strong influence of the Bible and the biblical world, where 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 we, we have angels and demons at this point, and there there certainly is a a very strong Christian and uh, Jewish presence in, in in Arabia during this time. So that's all all kind of. Uh, but the other the other part is is, is uh, that kind of the 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 beliefs of the pre-Islamic Arabian people. Uh, uh, th that's, I mean, th that's where the, the the jinn comes from. There's no, there aren't any jinn in the Bible, uh, but but the jinn are accepted in the Quran as a as a as a reality, as something, you know, just some a, a, a group of beings that coexist with humans that have certain abilities, and and they just assume that's true. And I, I, I don't, they don't even seem they don't question it. It's just it's it's part of the world in in which Islam was born, and it just be part of the Islamic world. This is one of the things in my book is I try to uh, distinguish um, the, the or, or that the, the, the Quran was, was was struggling to distinguish between uh, the beliefs that we have to completely uh, eradicate and those ancient beliefs that we can somehow adapt and and, and fit into our worldview and uh, and and the jinn were fit in as were from Indian culture and the uh, angels and demons were fit in from and I, I again, I don't know enough to know whether you know dominant Christian or dominant Jewish, but it, it was certainly floating in both of those uh, sphere times. So uh, I, I think that's maybe an, an acceptable answer to to, to to the doctor. Okay, all right. Not, not so right. anyway, thank you for those questions. That was really a challenge. Okay, yeah, and I think you handled it really well, Professor. So we really appreciate uh, your <clears throat> your answers to these two particular questions from these two. Uh, you know, giants of uh, Islamic studies. And of course, they were the yes. co-founders of ICSA. And, and you also spoke about ICSA. I think it was 2012 when they founded it together. They're, 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 they're two of my teachers. I mean, I learned, I learned tons from them, uh, from their books, from my interaction with them, and from the papers I hear at the conferences. They're, they're two of the major figures that I'm using to learn this vast field. Oh, for sure, for sure. And, and, uh, and, and of course, they've been really uh, good to the sh to this channel as well and to the show. And and I'm really thrilled that uh, I'm also in a position to learn from that as much as I can. So, Professor, um, we're right about uh, at the cusp of ending this episode. But just before we let you go, uh, we are after a podcast about books, so we have a couple of very staple questions which we love to ask our guests. And so, I'll just, <clears throat> with your permission, I'll just ask you one or two of these questions. Um, so, so the first question, sure, which sure. I'm told by a lot of our guests is a tough one, but I do hope that you'll be able to help us uh, with an answer. And the question is, if you could select a book that you feel that, let's say, every young person should read at least once in their lifetime, it may or may not be you know, related to biblical studies or Quranic studies, but if you could select a book that you feel that everybody in the world should read, should read at least once in their lifetime, what book would you select? Well, uh, first of all, by young, I'm assuming you mean like uh, late adolescent, early twenties, right. not like children. Right. Um, and I'm not going to do one book. I'm going to do a few. Um, 
I'm I I I'm a great believer in in some of the great 19th century novels that have just transformed the way I think about the world. I would I would include two Russian uh, novels, uh, War and Peace by Tolstoy and Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. I would include the British novelist uh, uh, Middle March by uh, George Eliot, and I'll be Dick by uh, uh, Herman Melville. Her, uh, those books okay. I've quoted in some of my earlier uh, publications because they've they had such an impact on me. And I I would say somewhere somewhere in, in everybody's life they should work through those okay. or been through a few times. I think okay. I always get new things out of them. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting, Professor, that you fix uh, fiction over nonfiction. Would you say that you're more of a nonfiction, I mean, more of a fiction guy than a nonfiction guy? You know, where do you see yourself? Or do you enjoy both genres equally? I, I, I will read nonfiction for my research, but I will never read nonfiction for pleasure or for personal enrichment. I only read fiction. And, and, and all the major changes in my life have been influenced by my reading of fiction. Okay. I, I I live for I live for stories. Correct. Okay, that, that's wonderful. So I, I'm sure that our audience that is towards the fictional event is going to be very thrilled uh, to hear that particular answer. Okay, so on that note, uh, you know, uh, for our viewers and listeners who have been with us all this time, firstly, thank you so much for staying till the end. Um, once again, if you haven't subscribed yet, you know, do please do so on YouTube, and do continue to download on Apple, Google, and Spotify. And the book, once again, is Solomon and the Ant, The Quran in Conversation with the Bible by Professor Dr. David Penchansky. Professor, my thanks to you as well. You've been a wonderful guest. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And uh, I really hope to have you back for a future episode uh, whenever you have your next book uh, coming out. And speaking of which, uh, do you have any new uh, writings in the pipeline or new books that are coming up that your fans and readers can look forward to? Well, uh, no, you, know, you could see my books take a long time, uh, but I, I haven't stopped. Uh, so after after the publication of Solomon and the Ant, I just kept going. I picked new passages. So I've I've already written a paper on on uh, uh, Surat Al Fil, the Elephant Surah, mm. and I've written a paper on Surat Hud, and both of those papers are on academia.edu. Uh, and uh, the paper that I'm working on for that, I'm going to read in uh, on in July on July fourth in uh, in uh, Pretoria, South Africa, at the International Society of Biblical Literature, and then I'll be reading a shorter version at the International Quranic Studies Association in San Antonio. So mm -hmm. those are the works that I'm currently working on. Just uh, I'm still just picking different Quranic passages and, and just living with them for months and months. Definitely, definitely, for sure. And so, of course, and if you ever do decide to morph those into a book, Professor, you know, we'd love to, uh, you know, we'd, we'd really be thrilled about it because we could get you back on the show to talk about that book if, if and when it does. God willing. Yes. Absolutely, inshallah. All right. Okay, so Professor, thank you once again for your time. Um, uh, we'll let you go now and uh, do please uh, take care and we really hope to uh, have you back someday whenever you have that next book published. So thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. All right, take care.